Radio Network. I'm your host, Nicholas Wansbutter, and uh, this afternoon I have, as usual for this show, the privilege of sharing the company of Father Bernard Utley, OSB, pastor of Our Lady of Victory Church in London, Ontario, Canada. So, Father, uh, welcome to another episode of The Spiritual Life, and uh, thank you for joining us. Oh, you're welcome. Good afternoon, Nicholas. Now, uh, we, we have a lot of, lot to cover, but if you don't mind, Father, I have a bit of housekeeping uh, to get out of the sure. way, and then we can dive uh, right into the topic. So, um, the, and the topic will be uh, today on Episode 2 of uh, The Spiritual Life, The Holy Ghost. The Spiritual Life is brought to you by our network sponsor, Audible.com. So if you're a bookworm, like all of us at the Restoration Radio Network, but too busy to devote hours at a time to read, then why not visit audible.com and check out the immense selection of downloadable audiobooks to your computer or smartphone. Right now, if you go to audibletrial.com forward slash restoration radio, you can get a free 30-day no-obligation trial membership, and you'll receive one free audiobook to try out their service. Uh, no complications. It's an easy to use intuitive audible application for your device and has great book titles. So you can go to audibletrial.com forward slash restoration radio. That's A-U-D-I-B-L-E-T-R-I-A-L dot com forward slash restoration radio. And uh, I have to say, I myself have signed up for uh, this trial, and it's a, it's a great service, and I'm very impressed with the, the selection they have and the, uh, the quality of their productions. So I encourage listeners to check that out. Of course, uh, you can also uh, get annual radio subscriptions directly to uh, the True Restoration Radio Network. We have uh, gold and platinum levels which give access to additional content, such as video interviews, uh, as well as supporting our apostolate. And that's available by clicking the Donate button at the bottom of the page, truerestoration.org. And uh, all Restoration Radio programs, including this one, are available at www.restorationradionetwork.com. That's all one word, Restoration Radio Network and are syndicated on iTunes and Stitcher. You can uh, follow the work of True Restoration on all social media channels, including Facebook, Twitter, Flickr, LinkedIn, and Pinterest, by following us using the social buttons at, or on the, the truerestoration.org website. So uh, that out of the way, we have a very... Uh, interesting and important topic to discuss today in the the Holy Ghost and I was just saying uh, to Father in the the pre-show that I think part of what makes it so important aside from the fact that it's the discussion of the most important being or uh, the Lord God in the person of the Holy Ghost but I think that in my experience uh, the third person of the Trinity the Holy Ghost tends to be one that people don't have as much devotion to, and if I can use the, the term, may even get a little bit neglected. So um, I, I'm really looking forward to the show, but before we get into that, I, Father, I think, I know you wanted to recap what we discussed last show. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, last episode I introduced Father Edward Lean. Um, he's the author I will be relying on as a rough guide and outline for 
many uh, episodes of the show on the spiritual life. And the book that we are currently using as our guide is Father Lean's excellent work called The Holy Ghost, His Work in Souls. That was published in 1935. And the last episode, I was only able to get through commenting on his introduction in the first chapter. I'm, I'm afraid that to get through this book in the way that I intended, it's going to take more than just three or four episodes, which I had originally thought it would take. But I think that's okay. Um, there isn't really a reason to rush through it. It will take as long as it takes, and anything worth doing is worth doing well. And I know that um, the next episode I'll probably be able to cover four, four of the chapters. Um, they kind of overlap each other, and I could just uh, join them into one show. But the last episode I really wanted to get in, into today's subject and cover chapter two of Father Lean's book on the Holy Ghost himself, and on the Holy Trinity, but I simply didn't have time, and there was no way I wanted to rush through Chapter 2, as it deals with a very important subject, and one of my most favorite subjects to meditate upon and discuss, namely the doctrine of the Holy Trinity, which includes, of course, the Holy Ghost, the very title of our book. And I, I thought it best to keep this episode focused on just this one chapter, instead of trying to fit too many other subjects in the episode. And I have, I have a lot to cover, so that I, I fear that it will be a long show, but if one is not able to listen to all of it live or in one sitting, the beautiful thing about these internet broadcasts is that you're able to download this talk to listen later, maybe in sections, uh, and more than once, hopefully. And today I will cover everything that Father Lean covers in Chapter 2, but I wanted to present it in a, a different order than he does, and I probably will not quote him too often, but I will give what he says in substance. But to you brought up specifically the Holy Ghost. This talk, I will deal with the Holy Ghost, uh, but I thought we need to have an understanding, first of all, of, of the very nature of God and the Holy Trinity in general before you appreciate what the Holy Ghost is. So the Holy Ghost will, will definitely be, uh, and his role in our spiritual life will come up in future episodes as well. So, I think first, um, I wanted to just briefly summarize the last episode. And it's funny, I, I tried uh, uh, summarizing the last episode. I wrote out a summary. And I was able to, to do that in, in probably, probably take me five minutes to summarize, and it took me almost two hours to, to speak last time. So, I thought that was a little funny that I could have done, had a lot easier on myself. But... In the previous episode, uh, we talked about how Father Lean analyzed and explained what goodness means, what love essentially is, namely the surrender to the attraction of, of, of to good, uh, of a willed yielding of our will when we see goodness. We choose it, we will it, and we love it. Love is in the will after our intellect sees something as good for us. Knowledge precedes love. We love what we see as good. When we talked about, we then talked about what we mean when we say that God is good, that God is infinite goodness, which basically means that he is infinite perfection, infinite attraction, infinite lovableness, that every perfection found in creation is only a faint reflection of the infinite perfection found in God. Obviously, these perfections are found in him in a super eminent way, without limitation, without all the imperfections that are found in creatures. But he has that perfection, perfection of goodness and beauty and truth and life and love in, in a most perfect way, infinite way. And that if anything attracts us in this life, if anything perfects us in this life, that quality that good quality, that goodness, uh, that beauty originally came from God. He is the source of all that. God is the supreme good, the, op the ultimate object of our desire, and the only being that can ever satisfy that practically infinite craving of our soul. Only the infinite God can fill the souls of this and give it rest. But God is not only good for us, but supremely good to us. He is kind and generous and provident and providing and fatherly. 
In other words, he loves his, he loves his creatures. He loves us. In this sense, he even loves sinners. He, sh he still showers upon sinners who are his enemies many gifts of creation. Although he hates sin, he's still very kind and merciful to those who do not deserve it in this life. He lets his sun shine upon the good and the bad. He lets his rain fall upon the good and the bad. And he lets even his enemies enjoy some good things in this life. And every good thing that we have in this life, every moment of existence, is a gift from the divine giver. It is a gift from his love. We are surrounded by his love constantly. And yet only a few respond properly and return love for love. And these are God's friends. And for these, he will reward them. And this is why Father Lean uh, titled this, his first chapter, uh, The First Mode of God's Love, His Loving Kindness to His Creatures. Now in the second chapter, Father Lean moves from the love of God as found manifested in creation, he moves to the love of God as found in God himself. We must remember that creatures are finite but God's love is infinite. No matter how great creation may be, uh, it, it doesn't manifest infinitely, perfectly and completely God's infinite love. It can't. It's only finite. It does not exhaust his love. And also, creation is not eternal. Once upon a time, this universe was nothing. And therefore, we have to ask, what was the object in God's mind? What did he know? Who did he know before he created us, before he created creatures? And what or whom did God love before he created the world of men and angels? Who did he love? And what was his life? We creatures foolishly think that we are God's primary life, that his primary life is creating us and preserving us and answering our prayers and concerning himself with our needs, that this is God's primary life. Really, we are not his primary life. We are not the main show. We are more or less a minor sideshow, almost like a hobby, as it were, compared to God's own proper life, his own inner life. And all of creation literally added nothing to the life of God. He gained nothing from creation. He didn't get any happier. He didn't get any busier. Because he, has, because he has us creatures to take care of. He's, he, he did not create in order to gain anything. He gains nothing, but only in order to give and to share the life of infinite happiness that he possessed from all eternity. So it's totally disinterested. And this brings us to the great mystery of the Holy Trinity and to that divine person who is divine love personified, the Holy Ghost. And this is why... Father Lean uh, entitled the next chapter, The Holy Ghost is Divine Love Subsistent. So before I go into this chapter, I want to take a step back and talk about our very notion of God in a general way. And then I want to talk about what a mystery is, and then specifically the mystery of the Holy Trinity. So first of all, I think for a healthy spiritual life, it is extremely important to have a healthy understanding of what we mean by God, what the Catholic understanding of God is. Every, everything depends on this. In order to have an exalted sanctity, we must have an exalted view of God, like the saints had. Now, we don't have to be highfalutin theologians or scholars to have this exalted view, but we must exert the effort to meditate on our faith. We must make some effort to know what the faith actually teaches us so that we can conform our mind and heart to it. The spiritual life is ultimately based on our belief in God, on what we believe. Not just a vague, a vague hope that some impersonal force is ruling things out there, or even some vague this someone is out there looking over us. Our faith has content to it, certain truths which must be the foundation of our spiritual life and our whole life not just our spiritual life, but even our day-to-day our -day lives. And if we do not have an exalted view of who and what God is, then we're not going to earnestly desire union with him. That's out the window. Because it, we are not going to value him very highly. We will not highly value union with him. 
sanctity will not be too important to us because God is not that important to us. And also, I find that if we don't have a, a deeper and fuller appreciation of what we mean by God, then we're not going to truly appreciate the magnitude of the other mysteries of our faith. For example, the doctrine of the Incarnation, that God became man. Well, if God doesn't mean much to you, the Incarnation it won't mean that much. That Our Lady is the Mother of God, that won't mean much to you. That sanctifying grace makes us partakers of the divine nature. That heaven is essentially the beatific vision. So if God does not awe us, then these other truths will not be that great for us. So let us begin at the beginning with him who had no beginning, the eternal one, God himself. Now even without getting into the mystery of the Holy Trinity, the Catholic understanding of the nature of God is very profound, very exalted. So let me start with this. And it may seem dry at first, perhaps a little abstract, but it's important to lay down some foundation. It's important to let these truths sink in and become part of our consciousness, our, our mental landscape, so that when we look out at the world, we look out in the, in the universe, that we will see these truths behind everything. So without, if, I could, if I could just interject for a second, Father, before you go into that, uh, as you're mentioning all that, that just reminded me of something we were discussing in the first show that I think may bear repetition, is I think a lot of people in the modern milieu tend to, uh, w without even wanting to, or we're just so saturated in the phenomenology uh, way of thinking of spirituality that I get, that is, you know, that's what spirituality is to the modern world, and it's certainly what it is in the Novus Ordo sect, whereas the Catholic idea of spirituality, as you've just pointed out again, it isn't about emotions or experiencing God or feeling God. Um, mm -hmm. And I think you actually said in a sermon recently uh, that, um, that it has nothing to do with emotions or feeling, but it's this mm -hmm. uh, knowledge that you speak about and, and, and yeah, absolutely. willing. And that is actually uh, one of the, the truths that we learn from even the mystery of the Holy Trinity, one of the applications, which I'll say later on, that we go to God by our intellect and our will, not by our feelings and emotions. And that is very important. The Catholic spirituality, true Catholic spirituality, is based on objective truths uh, and conforming yourselves to them and not conforming reality to your own subjective feelings. Mm -hmm. Right. So the, I, I, if you could uh, then uh, go on with your uh, mm -hmm. okay. exposition of, uh, of the infinite God, then I, I okay. think we have a firm, uh, firm grounding right. for moving into that. Okay. So without getting into the various reservations that uh, some traditional Catholics have in regards to the Trappist monk and writer Thomas Merton, I, I did want to mention something about him. He did write some beautiful things in the 1940s and 1950s, and, and all of them with imprimaturs. Um, but uh, there, some people have reservations. But I'll, I'll, I'll leave that aside for now. I remember reading his famous autobiography about his conversion to the Catholic Church uh, and his vocation as a Trappist monk and called The Seven-Story Mountain, which was written in 1948. And I was impressed with a particular section in it. Uh, what started the process of his conversion to the Catholic faith in the 1930s was reading a book by the great Catholic philosopher Etienne Gilson called The Spirit of Medieval Philosophy. And he was particularly moved by the chapter on the Catholic philosophical notion of God's existence in nature, that is, uh, that even of, of what reason alone can tell us about God and philosophy, without even getting into revelation. And reason can discover much about God. Not everything about God that we need as Christians, and that what we mean by God as a Christian, as a Catholic, for that we need divine revelation. But scholastic philosophy can prove a thick enough slice of God for an atheist to choke on and have no excuse for remaining an atheist. And this caused Merton, this view of God that this Catholic philosopher presented, which was the common view in the Middle Ages uh, of the time of St. Thomas Aquinas, his notion of God, that this caused Merton to have a great respect 
for the depth of Catholicism, and this eventually led towards his conversion into the Catholic Church. And the fundamental truth about God that impressed him is that, that not only does God exist, but that it is his very nature to exist. He exists in virtue of his own nature. He is not caused by anything or dependent upon anything to exist. And creatures are not like this. We exist, but we don't have to exist. We are contingent, dependent beings. God is a necessary being. And I remember um, I had a similar experience as a teenager, although I was always Catholic. I, I, I read as a teenager a, a Catholic philosophical textbook on natural theology. I happened, I didn't know anything about natural theology or theodicy, and I happened along this book, and uh, I was fascinated of, of everything that philosophy was teaching, of what reason alone can prove about God, his existence in nature. And I was blown away with this exalted notion of God as being the necessary being, that it is his nature to exist, that he cannot not exist, that he is self-existent being. And this is the primary truth about God. His, his essence, his nature, is his existence. His very nature is to be and exist infinitely. And all these truths about God, we can learn by reason and philosophy, but God has seen fit to tell us these truths himself in Revelation. And Moses asked the Lord, Lo, I shall go to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers hath sent me to you. If they should say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God says to Moses, I am who am. Thus shalt thou say to the children of Israel, He who is hath sent me to you. Those are powerful words. And to quote Frank Sheed, he says, This then is God's name for himself, He who is. When we have said He is, there is no more to be said. We have said everything. The only trouble is that we do not know all we have said, but we can begin to find out. All theology consists in finding out what is meant by the word he is, unquote. So this whole idea of God being pure being, as um, scholastic philosophy terms it, he is pure act. That is absolute, infinite, eternal perfection. And this is why God is immutable absolutely unchanging because he can't diminish in perfection. He can't grow in perfection because he's already perfect. He simply is infinite perfection. He cannot get more powerful because he is power itself. He cannot become more alive or have a greater vitality because he's not only, he not only has life, he is life itself, infinitely, boundless life. He cannot grow in knowledge because he is knowledge. Anything possible that there is to know, even possible, he is knowledge. He plumbs the depths of the possibility of what can be. He's not only, he not only has truth, he is truth itself. He can't grow in joy because he is joy. He's a boundless sea of peaceful and explosive joy. He cannot grow in love because he is love. He can't fall in love because he is love. Just like the, the sea can't get wet, it's already wet. He can't grow in love because he's simply love itself. And this is why God has to be eternal from all eternity, because time is really the measurement of change, of motion, and God cannot change because he cannot grow or diminish and act to perfection. He simply is. And he is not in time, which is the measurement of successive change. You know, in, in, in our world, every tick of the clock measures change in the universe in some way uh, electrons moving or changing in one way but in God there is no change he's not in time he is in eternity which is an ever-present now God possesses his the whole of his being perfectly infinitely all at once whereas we little creatures we have our being spread out in space and spread out over time in successive stages. You know, Nicholas, um, you have a certain uh, perfection of your age. You have, a, you have acquired a certain wisdom. But there's certain, you are not the same. You don't have all the, all the life that you had when you were a child. You, you spread out your being over time. 
And when you get older, you have more wisdom. And, and when you're young, you have more life. So our existence is not given to us all at once. We're kind of spread out. God has his existence, his perfection all at once, and it never changes. Um, creatures, uh, we can have existence as a gift from God, but this is important. God is existence. Absolute, infinite, limitless existence. Creatures only have some being and existence, a little thimble full of existence with, with, with definite boundaries. And that is what it means to be finite. Finite comes from the word finis, meaning end or boundaries. And our essences define what we are. Our natures define what we are. We are like a cup full of water. An angel is like a bucket full of water. He has more water than we do. He has more perfection, more existence than we do. But God is the infinite ocean of existence. Us compared to him, he is literally existence without boundaries. No limit to him. And this is why God must be a spirit. He has to be immaterial without a body. A material being, a physical being, is intrinsically limited because a material being is made up of parts spread out in space. That's essentially what a material being is, a physical being. It is something that is spread out in space. And what has parts can be taken apart. What has parts can be divided and changed. What has parts is necessarily finite and limited and potentially non-existent. And one thing I was, I was also deeply impressed by the various implication of these truths. And one of them, for example, is that since we creatures are absolutely and entirely dependent upon God, not only for coming into existence, we are also absolutely dependent upon God to, for him to maintain our existence from moment to moment. That God must uphold us in existence continually by the act of his will. And from this flows the truth of divine providence. Nothing can happen without the will or permission of God. Not a hair can fall from your head without your Heavenly Father, our Lord said. And following this doctrine flows the truth that God must be everywhere, that he is omnipresent. God is a spirit, and the spirit is where it acts. And God, since God must act everywhere, he has to be present everywhere, whole and entire. He is present upholding all things by his power and his presence. In every single electron, in every part of space, he has to be present there. And yet, we cannot imagine God, we should not imagine God as spread out in space. We mustn't imagine God to be this big blob, this big fog that goes everywhere. He's not larger than the universe. This is something, this baffles our imagination, but again, we can't, we have to, we have to, um, I'll deal with that later. We have to stop trying to imagine God. God is literally unimaginable. We have to realize that God is not, um, he's not, um, excuse me, I mean, I mean, God is not a large God. That's what I'm trying to get past. He's not big, he's not small, because he has no size. Size is a limitation. He is pure power, pure love, pure truth. And these things, even in our own experience, love, even in our own limited capacities, love doesn't have a color, it doesn't have a size to it, but it's extremely powerful, and it can work all over the world. Now, imagine, again, don't, maybe not imagine is the, the right word, but think of God as love in person power and infinite love, infinite power itself, infinite truth, that would be closer to what God is. Mm. And also, and it flows also from his eternity, God is not an old God. We think of God as being billions of years old. He's outside of time. He doesn't age with time. He is eternal. He simply is in an ever-present now. And this is why St. Augustine says to him, 
that he is ever ancient and ever new. So I, I think say, I've read, Father, that he... So, so would, that, would you say then that in, in a certain sense God is simultaneously present in all times at the same time? Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's actually a good point that um, I've often thought about that we are praying to the same God that sees Christ on the cross, that sees that, that Christ is God, suffering on the cross, and he sees us right now as though it were happening at the same time. To the Holy Trinity, all things that, are, that happen in time, he sees all at once. He doesn't, he doesn't have to say, well, let's find out what happens in a thousand years. I have to wait. He is already in the present. He's already in the next day. So the God that, that we are praying to right now is the God speaking to Moses in the burning bush right now, the God that is ever-present. And there's many other truths that perhaps flow from that that we'll deal with in, in prayer and other topics. But yes, uh, we have to have this great view of God. He's not just a, a, a great intelligent being in heaven. He is intelligence itself. He is knowledge itself. So when we say that God exists and that we exist, we're not using the word exist in absolutely the same sense. We're using the word analogously, not un univocally, which means that creatures are not real in the same sense that God is real. Yes, we are real, but creatures do not have being or existence in the same sense that God has being and existence. He is existence. We have existence in similar, similar ways, but also in vastly different ways. And I, perhaps the best analogy I can come up with is if I drew a picture of the sun with a yellow crayon on a piece of paper. I could not say that this sun that I just drew is just like the real sun in the sky. They both exist. Yes, that's true that they're both suns. They both exist in a certain way. But we all know that there's a vast difference in meaning when we say that this little picture that I just drew is the sun and when we say the sun in the sky is the sun. So in a similar way, our existence is vastly inferior to God's existence, infinitely inferior. We borrow existence on loan. We are contingent. We're absolutely dependent beings. Only God is pure, self-existent being and existence. I am who am. He who is. We are nothing compared to God, literally. We are, not. We are something compared to ourselves, but compared to God, we are closer in perfection to an ant or a flea than we are to God. Because between us and God, there's an infinite distance. And between us and an ant, it's finite. So we have to, we have to get out of this, this idea that the, our modern, modern tendency is two things. To treat God either as an extra, which means he's not important at all, or almost like an equal, not that important. Or... Or we overlook this immeasurable distance, difference between his infinity and our finitude. And I think many, many people, without realizing it, look upon God almost in the way the ancient pagans looked upon Zeus. You know, God is seen as a very powerful being up in the clouds, but he, he is almost pictured as having a shape, a, a, a body of some kind. In other words, we, we, we create this limited God of our own imagination. And God is not like that. Of course, the second person of the Holy Trinity became man, took to himself a human, a human nature. But from all eternity, God is a pure spirit. And God has made us, us into his own image and likeness. But man turns around and tends to make God into his own limited image and likeness. And just because man is like God, it doesn't mean that God is like man. Just as a statue of a man is like a man, but a man is not like a statue. God is far more than we can possibly imagine and understand. And we should not want a God that we can imagine or totally comprehend. We, we, sh we must not be satisfied with a finite God. We cannot be satisfied with a limited God. And this leads me into what Frank Sheed was trying to accomplish in a beautiful book he wrote, 
an introduction to Catholic theology. One of my favorite books is Theology and Sanity. He wrote it in 1946. I highly recommend this book. Uh, Frank Sheet spends the first few chapters trying to get the readers to see the difference between our imagination and our intellect so that we do not become slaves to our imagination. And why is this important? Because God literally cannot be imagined. He is beyond our imagination. Because the imagination is, is the power of making mental pictures in our mind of things that we have seen and heard and sensed in one way or another in the material world. But God is not material. He is a spirit. He has no physical or material qualities. And therefore, he cannot be imagined. He is he's literally beyond our imagination. He is also beyond our intellect, our understanding, as well. But that is because he is infinite and our minds are only finite. He is literally beyond definition. And Human language is not adequate to utter God, to explain him, but it is the highest that we have, and we have to do the best we can. We have to use our language. But the first step in getting anywhere in our understanding of God is stop relying so much on your imagination. You have to use your intellect more. This is also very important um, if we ever want to understand what the prayer of contemplation is, what mystical prayer is. It is beyond the imagination, literally. It is the communication with God as a spirit to spirit without images and words. But that's, um, contemplation is really a subject for a whole other episode, which I want to deal with in the future. So to get back to the nature of God, I want to quote again Frank Sheep in his book, Theology and Sanity. He says, God must have all the perfections found in creation, but in an immeasurably higher and more perfect manner without any of the imperfections or necessary limitations found in creatures. Since knowledge and love are to be found in created things, knowledge and love must be in God. God must know and love. And this is the bare minimum that we mean when we speak of God as personal. A person is a being who can know and love. God is someone, not only something. A person, not only a power. He not it, a father, and not just a force, unquote. Now, I, I, we don't think enough of what all, the, all this really means. I, these truths are revolutionary. These truths, even these al alone about the nature of God, have potential to radically change our spiritual lives, I think. If we, if we really took them to heart, if we truly believed them and treated God accordingly, God must be everything to us. He is the source of all perfection, the meaning of our life, the, the ultimate source of our peace and happiness. And this is the crux of the problem. And, and Father Faber, he wrote a, a whole book called Creator and Creature because he believed that if only we truly realize what it means to be a creature, what it means to have a creator, we would be saints. We would be put in our place, and that place would give us sanity and peace and holiness because humility is truth. It, it is it is living where you belong. We are nothing of ourselves. God is everything. God, is, God must be everything to us. The most important being in our whole life. Uh, and the great sin, uh, according to Father Faber, is forgetfulness of God. Or more precisely, forgetfulness of what it means to be a creature and what it means to have a creator. It's, uh, we forget that God is a personal being with intelligence and love, a person much more than we are persons. We treat him almost like just an abstract force. God is up there. He may listen to our prayers, but he's not a real person. And indeed he is. He's a personal being. In fact, he's three persons, which we will get into. But that he's real. He's more of a person than, than I am. I, I say I, but God is the supreme I. I am who am. I only borrow a little bit of that, that, that perfection of personhood. But he is the supreme person, or three persons, as we get, as we shall see. God is not a solitary person, not just one divine person, but three divine persons. There are three who possess this infinite divine nature in perfect unity. Obviously, God is a mystery. The divine nature is a mystery to us creatures, but no mystery is deeper than the mystery of the Holy Trinity, which, which I need to, to get into.
Yeah, well, <clears throat> the, as you mentioned, uh, the, the word uh, mystery, that, that's something that I think bears a little bit more discussion of what that word means, because it's another one of those words that it seems to me has been redefined in the, our modern time, or is used in such a way so that people have a, an idea that a, a mystery is something that's uh, unsolvable or unsolved mm -hmm. and therefore unknowable. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, for example, a, an unsolved mystery, a crime that's an unsolved mystery, mm -hmm. it's, a, you know, it, it's completely unknown who, who committed this crime and it's a mystery, therefore we'll never be able to know who did it. And certainly the um, people in the Novus Ordo sect like to say that a lot of things are a mystery and, and therefore it's not binding because it's a mystery. So you can't, you know, no one, no one can know the, mm -hmm. the true answer to this thing. But uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I suspect that, that, that that's not the, uh, the proper definition. No, not, not, not quite. Um, it's, that's escapism, you know. They're using that as an excuse to be uh, lazy, ignorant, uh, intellectually lazy. And because um, really a, a mystery is a truth revealed by God that is above reason. Reason could never prove it and discover it but it's not contrary to reason. Uh, and, and a mystery, really, it, it's, a tr it's not a truth about which we can know nothing. Rather, it is a truth about which we cannot know everything, and there is a vast difference. Let me repeat that. A mystery is not a truth about which we can know nothing. It's, it's rather a truth about which we cannot know everything. You can know something. You cannot know everything, but you can know something. And there is a vast difference. A mystery is, should not be looked upon. It's not pure darkness to our mind so that we cannot see anything at all. It is rather too much light. It's a light so bright, so colorful, so deep that we can never exhaust it or see all of it. But it's still a light to see and to see by. It is a truth to contemplate and a truth that sheds light on reality and, and, and our whole life. It's a truth that nourishes the soul and uh, lights up our, our way. You know, sometimes the excuse is, um, well, because I can't totally comprehend it, I'm not even going to try. But just because, for example, just because we cannot drink the whole ocean doesn't mean we shouldn't drink some water. And in the same way, just because we cannot drink the whole ocean of truth doesn't mean that we should not try to fill the tiny symbol of our mind with all the water of truth that we can fit. Just because we cannot entirely comprehend a mystery does not mean that we should cease thinking about it. And to call a doctrine a mystery is not to put a sign on it that says, stay away, don't bother wasting your time. Rather, it is a sign that says, come and drink of this bottomless fountain. Satisfy your soul, all you that thirst for truth. It's a bottomless well uh, that satisfies the soul the more and more you drink from it. But you'll never exhaust it. you never come to the end of it. Uh, but it is soul satisfying. It's, it's like a, an art gallery. Each room is more marvelous than the one you just came from. And as you go deeper and deeper, you see more and more beauty. Uh, but that's really what a mystery is. The, mis the mysteries of our faith were not revealed by God merely to be shelved as a puzzle of no one practical importance for our spiritual life and are simply to be ignored and left for scholars uh, to argue about. And some people, I think, have the idea that the less you know about the faith, the more of the virtue of faith you necessarily have. But that's not true. You, saints, according to that, them, saints like St. Thomas Aquinas had less faith than a simple peasant because he knew more he knew more than them, so he didn't have enough faith, as much faith as they did. That's, that is false. To the contrary, it is because he knew more about the Catholic faith and the Catholic mysteries that he had to exercise a greater faith, for he saw more than the average person how great the mystery actually is. Ignorance of a mystery or any doctrine of the Catholic faith is not the same as the virtue of faith. It's simply ignorance. Ignorance is not a virtue, and neither is knowledge in and of itself. 
but knowledge of the truth can greatly assist our faith. You know, we have to make an act of faith. When we study our faith, we make acts of faith and we grow in faith by saying, I believe that. And that's what the faith is. Faith is not a feeling, it's not an emotion, it is a virtue of our intellect, our mind, whereby the intellect firmly accepts a truth revealed by God because God has revealed it. But if you didn't even know what the truth is, you can't make that act of faith. And that's why we study the faith. We grow by studying. I think also some people like to use or, or misuse a verse from the following of Christ, especially deal, dealing with the Holy Trinity. I've heard this one. What does it profit you to have a profound knowledge and to argue about the Holy Trinity if you lack humility and thereby displease the Holy Trinity? Yes, yeah, that's true. That's true. Without humility and reverence and love of God, such knowledge is profitless. But with humility, with reverence and the love of God and His grace, a, a, knowledge, a, a simple knowledge and working knowledge of the Catholic doctrine concerning these truths of our faith, these magnificent truths of our faith, uh, that is pleasing to God. That is what we're supposed to be. Because when it, the bottom line is that God wants to be known by us. This is an important point. This means that when we try to understand a mystery with humility and, and in prayer, it is not so much us trying to reach up to God. It is God drawing us to himself. He's giving us light. He's inviting us to himself. He's picking us up. You know, and this is, this is a truth of, of sanctity, is that the saints were not so much conscious that they were getting closer to God, but that God was getting closer to them. And I mean by that is that he was reaching down and bringing them up like a father does to his child. And there are two types of religion. One in which man tries to develop a technique uh, to reach the divinity, or enlightenment, or whatever you call it. But our religion is not so much man's search for God, it is God's search for man. He is the hound of heaven. And that should be an encouraging truth. He wants to be known and loved. He wants us to be saints. And so we can all expect the graces and helps to accomplish it. Now, not wanting to know more about God, cold indifference to God. Here God, he is as a lover does. He reveals secrets about himself. And our side, we're, we're not really interested. That's coldness. Every lover wants to, every, someone who loves wants to share his inner secrets with the beloved. He wants to be known and accepted for who and what he is. And God is like that too. He reveals himself to us in order to be loved. He wants us to be loved. Not because he needs our love, but because we need to love him. And so he reveals himself to us. And we shouldn't be coldly indifferent to that, and especially the doctrine of the Holy Trinity. And therefore, we should at least try to partially fill the tiny symbol of our mind with the pure water of truth. Because that's the whole reason. It is to know and love the Holy Trinity that the angels and men were created. That's the whole po point. But like all the mysteries of our holy Catholic faith, we're not asked to fully comprehend it, but only to believe it firmly. And we have to submit our minds and hearts in all humility. An ordinary common sense that tells us that we can't, we can't hold the whole ocean of truth in our mind, but we can at least try to fill ourselves up, at least to our, each our, our own capacity. The, and really, the, the, the person who says that he completely understands the mystery of the Holy Trinity has not even begun to understand it, or else he is talking about some limited God of his own creation and not the infinite God who lives in inaccessible light. And at the end of this talk today, if you completely understand the Holy Trinity, then I have made a mistake somewhere. So I'm not trying to remove the mystery. I'm trying to tell you what the mystery is so you can nourish yourself on it. Well, uh, we're just coming up on the top of the hour, and for those of you who are just joining us, you're listening to The Spiritual Life, Episode 2, on the Restoration Radio Network. I am Nicholas Wansbutter, and I'm joined by Father Bernard Utley, OSB, and uh, today we are discussing the doctrine of the Holy Trinity in the context of our spiritual life, and we'll be speaking more specifically about uh, the Holy Ghost this episode. 
And uh, we want to remind listeners that The Spiritual Life is a production of the Restoration Radio Network. All rights are reserved, and any duplication without explicit written permission is forbidden. However, if uh, you do contact us, the permission to reproduce our shows will usually be quite easily given. Uh, so with that, that said, Father, I, th- I uh, think we're ready to go into then that mystery of uh, okay. the Holy Trinity. Okay. And again, my, my concern is not to prove the existence of God or to prove these doctrines apologetically or, to, or even to prove the doctrine of the Holy Trinity from Scripture. That's not really the concern of these shows. It's not an apologetic show. It's a show on the spiritual life. And my concern is to show how the doctrine of the Holy Trinity relates to the spiritual life, how it is ultimately the foundation of our spiritual life and the end and purpose of our existence, really, of of our own spiritual life. Uh, But to show this, I have to first present the doctrine, because dogma will feed devotion and be the foundation of devotion. So let me just state the the doctrine of the Holy Trinity, uh, just state it simply. The Catechism states this mystery very simply. One God and three divine persons. The three divine persons are equal in all things because they are one and the same God, having one and the same divine nature and substance. And many difficulties, I think, um, will be uh, resolved if we keep in mind a, a very simple yet important distinction, and that's the distinction between the ideas of person and nature. And every day, we continually make this distinction. If I were to ask you, Nicholas, who are you? You would answer Nicholas Swansbutter, a person. And if I asked you, what are you? You would say, I'm a man, I'm a human, I'm one man. This is your nature, your essence, what you are. And therefore, the word who refers to the person, And the word what refers to the nature. So in you, Nicholas, there is only one who and one what. Now, when you do something, it is the person who does things. But you do them through and by your nature. It is someone's nature that conditions what they can do. But the responsibility of one's action is placed on the person and not the nature. We have a finite human nature, our soul is a finite spirit with limited spiritual powers to think and love and and act, but God is an infinite spirit with almighty power to think and love and live and create from nothing. So the nature of something is that being's essence considered as the source of its activity, of what it can do. Now let, let me just use this example of, let's think of uh, the True Restoration radio host, you, you, Nicholas, and Stephen Heiner, and Justin Soder, you are distinct persons. Each of you has your own intellect, your own will, and your own human nature, where you, you, where you're with you, you think and choose and function. And Stephen cannot think with Justin's intellect or mind. And you cannot will or choose something with Stephen's will. You have your own will. You have similar natures, All of you have natures that are alike, you're all human, but all of you do not possess the same nature, numerically speaking. There are three separate natures. Each of you has your own that belongs to you. Now suppose that all three of you possessed only one nature, and if I were to ask you, who are you, you would reply, I'm Nicholas, Stephen, and Justice, Justin. If I were to ask you, what are you, all three of you would answer, we are one man. So there would be three human persons and one human nature, three who's and one what. Now, of course, this doesn't happen naturally, but it's not against reason. It's not against reason. And somewhat the same is true of God. There are three who's, but only one what. They do not divide up the divine nature into three sections. They don't share part of the nature nor do they, they have similar natures. They have the same nature. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost each possess the one divine nature. Remember that word numerically. There's only one God. Remember, nature decides what something is and what something can do. The Father is God. The Son is God. The Holy Ghost is God. And therefore, all are equally infinite and powerful. None is greater or less than the others. 
The father is not older than the son. The son is not younger than the father, and etc. They have only one mind. We have to remember there's only one divine mind, one divine will. And the three persons, they're not separate gods. They're only distinct persons. So therefore the mystery is not a mathematical one. The mystery doesn't try to force us to believe that three equals one. That would be nonsense. God is three in one sense and one in another sense. Three persons, one nature. The per person answers who someone is and nature answers what something is. So to put it simply, in God there are three who's but only one what. And I just want to remind everyone to hammer this home that we must not think of the Holy Trinity as three separate beings. That would be tritheism, three gods. We believe in one God. God is one. The being of God is one. But this one divine being is three persons, distinct but not separate. So we mustn't imagine the three persons to be three bodies, three men, three males sitting on a throne in heaven. Uh, of course, we, we refer to God in the masculine pronoun because this is how he has revealed himself, and we respect that. And there's a deep theological meaning for this. But God is a spirit. He doesn't have a body. He, the second person, assumed, uh, did take to himself a human nature in the incarnation, but that was in time, not from eternity. So let's not, we, we have to not use our imagination, not try to think of three separate, separate beings. There's only one God, one being. And also, just to throw this in, I won't go deeply into this, but again, one of the, another error uh, with regard to the Trinity is you mustn't think of the, the three divine persons as three modes of God's life. It wasn't like the Father is, is, is God acting um, uh, providently and kindly towards us, and then the Son is, is a different uh, mode of his being. It, it's not that. It's not just three aspects of viewing God. It's not like, well, this way he's a father, and this way we can see that he's love. No, it's three distinct persons. Just like I'm a real person, you're a real person, there are three real persons who, who, uh, who uh, possess the one divine nature. And sometimes <clears throat> certain analogies are used to illustrate the Holy Trinity, but, you know, to be honest, none of these really work perfectly. An analogy is when something is like another thing in one way, but unlike it in another way or ways. All analogies limp. They only go so far and usually not that far. So really, a shamrock doesn't really work because three, the three persons of the Holy Trinity are not three parts of one God, but the three leaves are parts of the clover leaf. Um, or three distinct sections or sides of God. And drops of water don't work. Three drops of water added together are more than just one drop. But three divine persons is not more God than just one divine person. One divine person is fully God. And contrary to uh, those who love that beautiful movie about St. Joseph of Cupertino, the reluctant saint, a, a blanket folded in three doesn't really work either because obviously God isn't a blanket. And three, three folds show three separate sections of a blanket. A divine person is not, uh, the Father is not one-third of God. He's the whole God. The Son is not one-third of God. The Father and Son are not two-thirds of God or two sections of the fold. So really, no material analogies really work to describe a spiritual mystery. They do not help one to really understand the real mystery uh, they, help, they help one to swallow the doctrine, perhaps, so they don't, oh, yeah, I see that now, and then they move on and think about more important subjects. And yet, I suppose it's better to at least swallow the doctrine than reject it, but at least it's best to really try to understand what the church is actually teaching us. And probably the clearest statement of our belief in the Holy Trinity is the famous Athanasian Creed, and it was written in the 5th century, not by St. Athanasius, but it is an official creed of the church, and I wanted to recite that, just to be clear that this is our faith. This is the Catholic faith in the Holy Trinity. And then I will move on to God's interior life and explain the relationship between the Father and Son and the Holy Ghost. So, to quote the Athanasian Creed, Whosoever will be saved, 
before all things, he must hold the Catholic faith. He who does not keep this faith whole and undefiled, without doubt, shall perish everlastingly. And the Catholic faith is this, that we worship one God in three persons, in Trinity and Unity, neither confounding the person nor dividing the substance. For there is one person of the Father, another of the Son, and another of the Holy Ghost. But the divinity of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost is all one, the glory equal, the majesty co-eternal. For as the Father is, so is the Son, and so is the Holy Ghost. The Father uncreated, the Son uncreated, and the Holy Ghost uncreated. The Father infinite, the Son infinite, and the Holy Ghost infinite. The Father eternal, the Son eternal, and the Holy Ghost eternal. And yet there are not three eternals, but one eternal. As also there are not three uncreated, not three infinities, but one uncreated and one infinite. So, <clears throat> so likewise the Father is almighty, the Son almighty, and the Holy Ghost almighty. And yet there are not three almighties, but one almighty. So the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Ghost is God. And yet there are not three gods, but one God. So likewise the Father is Lord, the Son Lord, and the Holy Ghost Lord. And yet there are not three lords, but one Lord. For just as Christian truth compels us to acknowledge every person by himself to be God and Lord, so we are forbidden by the Catholic religion to say that there are three gods or three lords. The Father is made of none, neither created nor begotten. The Son is of the Father of alone, alone, not made nor created, but begotten. The Holy Ghost is of the Father and of the Son, neither made nor created, nor begotten, but proceeding. So there is one Father, not three fathers, one Son, not three sons, one Holy Ghost, not three Holy Ghosts. And in this Trinity, none is before or after other, none is greater or less than another, but the three persons are co-eternal together and co-equal, so that in all things, as is aforesaid, unity in Trinity and Trinity in unity is to be worshipped. He, therefore, that will be saved must think thus of the Trinity. I've always looked upon that creed as, as just, a, 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 it's been called the war song of faith. It is a, a beautiful, beautiful description of the Holy Trinity. Uh, though, uh, <clears throat> listening to that, and of course I've read it before, but just listening to it again, I think that then it leads me to the question, if um, all three persons of the Holy Trinity are so equal in all ways, all possess in the same nature, how can they be distinguished then from one another? Mm -hmm. um, that is actually the really the heart of the mystery, which we will never fully understand because only the infinite God can comprehend himself, but we can explore a little further and Catholic theology helps us see a little more into the, this mystery. The key to the mystery is in the relationship between the three divine persons. And this may seem a little too abstract, but I will say it anyway. We have to get this straight. The Father is really identical with the divine essence, and the Son is really identical with the divine essence. But they each possess this one divine essence in their own way. So each bears their own relation to the divinity and to each other. And this is the only thing that distinguishes them apart from each other. In everything else, they are equal and perfectly one. So it's the relationship between the divine persons. That's what distinguishes them. Uh, they are all equal God. Um, but the Father possesses the divinity as unbegotten and unperceiving. And the Son possesses the same divinity as begotten, as received from the Father. And the Holy Ghost possesses the same divinity as proceeding from both the Father and Son. And although this may seem uh, abstract, they should, be, they should become clearer as we go along. And over the centuries, the fathers of the church, the doctors of the church, and other illustrious theologians have tried to plunge deeper into the mystery of the Holy Trinity by using clues from Revelation, which are God-given insights into the inner life of God. And St. Augustine was one of the first who formulated very well this relationship between the three persons of the Holy Trinity and St. Anselm was another saint that developed this presentation and St. Thomas and of course all theologians but I will so I will briefly present this 
their explanation, which isn't really an explanation, but an expounding of the mystery. And so with the deepest reverence and humility, I, I don't, or at least I hope, I, I wish uh, um, not to, to pry into in things that we should not know, but theology presents this to us. And so I will, in order to penetrate a little further into the sanctuary of the divine trinity, to catch a glimpse of what traditional Catholic theology teaches us, teaches us of, of the, the mysterious interior life of God himself. And something that we often forget is that God is infinitely and supremely alive. He doesn't just have life. He is life itself. And usually we tend, like I said, we tend to think that God's main life consists in managing the world, creating us, sustaining us, providing for his creatures. But in reality, as I said, cre all creation is really just a sideshow to God. It's not his primary preoccupation, not his primary life. And if all creatures were to cease to exist this very moment, it would not change the Holy Trinity one bit. Now, we, we naturally judge something to be alive because it moves. But the most perfect and highest kind of life is not external movement or locomotion, but inner movement, the movement of a spirit that is the activity of the mind in knowing and the activity of the will in loving. So to know and to love has to be the expression of the inner life of God. And stated as briefly as possible, the relation between the three persons is this. The Father begets the Son through an infinite and eternal act of his intellect. And then the Father and the Son breathe forth in an infinite and eternal act of love, the Holy Ghost. So let me, now let us go step by step into each of these. So I begin with the Eternal Father and his only begotten Son. So from all eternity, God was, or rather he simply is, possessing the full plenitude of being and existence, possessing and enjoying all perfection of truth and goodness and beauty and power and joy and life and love. And God is a spirit, though. He's infinitely perfect. But every spirit, including ourselves in our own little finite way, has the ability to, to gaze at oneself, to look at oneself intellectually, to become at the same time subject and object, at the same time the thinker and the thing thought. And God has this ability too in an infinitely perfect way. And from all eternity, God's mind is necessarily infinitely active because God can't act with only part of his knowledge because he has no parts. His knowledge is himself. And when he acts, he puts his whole self into his action. He is pure act. Now, God's first and eternal thought is of himself. Because there is nothing else to know from all eternity. Only he is eternal. And besides, only his own infinite being could be the adequate object of his knowledge. Nothing else could satisfy his infinite power of knowing. And he knows himself perfectly. He cannot help but know himself. And with all the power of his infinite mind, God knows and contemplates himself and all his infinite and boundless perfections. He knows himself perfectly, absolutely, plumbs the depths of all existence, all possibility. And through knowing himself, there is conceived from all eternity in his divine mind one single and eternal thought. And we call this idea the word of God. Not a spoken word, but a mental word that remains in the mind. And just as we, when we form an idea of something, or even of ourselves, an idea of ourselves, we do not need to express that idea externally by a physical sound made up of vowels and consonants, not even an imaginary sound in our mind. But we can leave that idea, surely an idea, in our mind, so that the word mental word means the pure idea itself, the mental double of a thing. When you think of a tree, you don't have to necessarily say, I'm thinking of a tree right now. You have that truth, that concept, that idea of a tree in your mind. It doesn't matter what you call it. You have that, that concept in your mind. And so uh, this is a thought replica of a thing in the mind. And the Greeks, to the Greeks, this mental word they called logos. Logos. And that is why 
uh, the second person of the Holy Trinity is called Logos, the Word. Now this thought in the mind of God is the perfect idea or image of God. It is the exact, exact reproduction of ravishing beauty of all that the infinite God is. It is perfect. But to be an adequate and complete expression of God, this word, this idea, must possess this divine nature itself in all its fullness and perfection because nothing less than God could adequately express God. Only God himself could fully express God. And indeed, this, this word is so perfect that it must be a real person, a divine person, infinitely alive like the Father is. For in God, in God there can be no imperfection. This word is wisdom and knowledge personified, truth in person, the knowledge of God in person. So now we have two divine persons, God as thinker who contemplates himself, he's a person, the first person of the Holy Trinity, and now God as thought, as the one conceived in the mind of God. And he is a real divine person too. He is the second person of the Holy Trinity, the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. When we think of something, it is sometimes said that we become the father of that thought. We conceive that idea. Now the Father eternally conceives this Word in his mind. And the relation between this first divine person and his Word there is the relationship of father to son. The father eternally generates or begets this divine person as his son and to whom he, he communicates his nature, his life, and all his perfections. Like father, like son. The son inherits everything that belongs to the father. What belongs to the father? The divine nature. That is his. And he gives it all to his son, himself. He gives his very being to his Son. So God the Father is the origin, the source, the fountainhead of all that the Son is. The Father gives all that he is to the Son. And the Son has received everything from the Father. He's received it, but he has received everything. And therefore he's equally God. The Father is not greater than the Son because the Father gave everything to the Son. Everything, his whole being. And so the words Father and Son on earth, uh, we, we use those words, the relationship between them on earth is only a created analogy, a faint reflection of the infinite relationship between, between the first and second persons in God. Any created thing that brings forth something like itself is a faint reflection of this eternal divine generation of the Son. All creation itself is a finite, faint, and very limited image of some of the perfections of God. Whereas the divine word is the perfect image of God because he is God himself. And God has given us both terms, the word and the son of God, to describe the second person of the most holy trinity because they tell us two distinct truths about him as word that he dwells in the mind of God so that he dwells in uh, what we call the bosom of the eternal father. That's why we use that word because he, he is not a separate being from God. He dwells in God. He is in the Father and the Father is in him, as he said, told us. And yet he is a distinct person, equal to the Father. And that's why we use the word Son, because the Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Father. And this is truly, it's a wonderful mystery. It's a beautiful mystery. And St. Paul tells us in the epistle to the Hebrews, he says, His Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world, who is the brightness of his glory and the figure of his substance, upholding all things by his power. That's why we say in the Nicene Creed, he is God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father. And finally, before we move into dealing with the third person of the Holy Trinity, I want to remind everyone that this divine generation is eternal. It did not begin. It does not end. It always is. It's in eternity and not in time. And I cannot help but quote a beautiful paragraph by Father Faber from his book, Bethlehem. Uh, Father Faber has written some of the most beautiful things about the Holy Trinity I've ever seen. He's, he's joining 
a beauty of a poet and a deep theologian at the same time, and it's hard to match that. So I will quote a paragraph from him, mostly repeating what I said, but in a more beautiful way. He says this, Unbeginning is the life in that paternal bosom. Yet what do we mean by unbeginning? It is a thought we cannot think, too real a reality to be other than a mere word to finite creatures like ourselves. It is good to try to stretch ourselves to its height and breadth, for there is no rest equal to the weariness that comes of striving to embrace the thought of God. In that bosom, the divine person, who is the babe of Bethlehem, was born, who yet never began to be born, and has never done being born. Never was the unbegotten father with the unborn son, unbegotten and eternally begotten. What but faith shall distinguish between the two? Faith, or the vision which is faith's crown hereafter? As there never was a time when the son was yet unborn, so can there never be a time when he will cease being born. It is in eternity, and not in time, that his inexplicable generation finds room. He proceeds from the Father by way of generation. He proceeds from the understanding of the Father. He is the Father's understanding of himself, or rather he is produced by it. He is the expression of all the Father's perfections. He is not merely the similitude of the Father, because he has something more. He is consubstantial with him, yet he is not identical with the Father, because he has a distinct person from him. The Father knows himself, and by his knowledge of himself, the Son is born amid the splendors of uncreated holiness, amid the inconceivable jubilations of the divine perfections. Thus, the generation of the Son is not a mystery done and over. It was not even at some remote point before ever time was. That which is eternal must always be going on. That which can end must have begun. We must be careful, therefore, always to bear in mind that the co-equal, co-eternal Son is ever being begotten in the bosom of the Father, at this moment as well as from forever. There was no moment when he was not begotten, no moment when he is not being begotten, no place through all the amplitudes of omnipresence in which his eternal generation is not forever going on, close to us or far away from us, outside us in outward space, inside us in the noiseless center of our souls. Yet nowhere is the silence broken by that stupendous utterance of the Father. The omnipresent word does not so much as vibrate on the air when he rushes forth with the irresistible might of the Godhead. Unquote. I've always loved those words of Father Faber. Uh, very beautiful, and they've always touched me. And he brings out a point, uh, you know, when you join the doctrine of the omnipresence of God, God being everywhere, this is true of the Holy Trinity. The Holy Trinity is present everywhere, whole and entire. And these, uh, this generation of the Father and the Son is present everywhere. And now, now we, we have to introduce the third person of the Holy Trinity, who is to us perhaps the most mysterious one of all three. Now a spirit has two faculties or powers, the intellect and the will. And God, who is the spirit of spirits, the great spirit, the infinite spirit, by his understanding he generates a divine person called the Son. Now what about God's eternal and infinite will? The will is that faculty or power where, where a person chooses or decides or acts in other words, its function is to love. The function, the primary function of the will is to love. But to love what? What does God love? He loves the infinite good, the only thing worthy of his entire love. And what is that infinite good? It is himself. He is infinite goodness and infinite beauty himself. And so the Father and Son, seeing each other, love each other with all the power of the divine will and gazing upon each other's infinite goodness and perfection they are drawn towards each other's limitless attractiveness in almost uh, you could say a mighty surge of spiritual emotion as it were as father lean uses you know human words are totally inadequate to express these divine realities but it's like a, a, a sigh of infinite love and satisfaction in the presence and possession of what is supremely good and lovable you know, when anyone who has ever been in love understands this, this, this sigh, this desire, the, the magnetic attraction for the beloved, 
when one is in, in love, one just wants to go out of oneself and be united with the beloved, wants to give all to the beloved and receive all from, from, from the beloved, and wants to express one's love in one, if it were possible, in one huge explosion of love, one big, I love you, that will give perfect expression of each other's love. And true love is always ecstatic. You go out of yourself, as it were, to the beloved. You give of yourself. You give yourself completely to the beloved. And the same is true for the first and second person of the Blessed Trinity. They can't help it. And to some of us, I've had this objection when I, when I presented this before, that, 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 that they think this divine love it sounds strange or somehow inappropriate. But we must not think of the divine persons as two males. It's not like that. God is a spirit. The Father uh, uh, is not a male. He's masculine. We use a masculine term. But don't, let's not turn it into something inappropriate. The Father is a divine person, an infinite spirit. And the second person, although he took a human nature again in the incarnation, uh, from all eternity he is a pure spirit. And the words Father and Son and the relationship between them on earth is, is a created analogy, a faint reflection of the infinite relationship between the first and second persons of God. And as Father Lean writes, into this movement of love between the Father and Son is poured all God's energy, all God's reality, all his power of loving, all his divinity is poured in that, that act of love. They love each other so perfectly and completely that their act of love is equal to them in all things. It is equal to them. It possesses all of their divine perfections. And, it sh and in order to do this, only God can express God completely. Only God is equal to that. And so that, that this act of love shares their divine nature. Their love expresses itself as it does in those ineffable moments in which we indicate that we have given everything. And that's why, the, with a sigh or a breath, and that is why the third person of the Holy Trinity is called the Holy Spirit. Spiritus means breath. And I wanted to mention this, that actually sometimes we traditional Catholics, we, we use the word Holy Ghost, which is, is accurate, but that's the Saxon word for, for spirit and geist. But spirit, when we say Holy Spirit, that's not modernism. That's actually a transliteration of the word spiritus. Spiritus sanctus is Holy Spirit. Uh, so it's not modernist. We should use both terms interchangeably and not fear either one. Spirit is actually more accurate theologically. Um, but this, this, being, this act of love between the Father and Son, he is the eternal, everlasting, uh, subsistent, and unchanging bond of loving union between the Father and the Son. He is love itself. He is love personified. And that is why... Also, you see this relationship between the persons. Um, this is why we, we Catholics believe that the, the, that the Holy Ghost proceeds from the Father and the Son, filioque, as we say in the Nicene Creed. Because if the Holy Ghost were to proceed from the Father alone, he would be another Son. He would be the same person as the Word of God. So he has to proceed from, the, from uh, both the Father and the Son to be a distinct person. Because there has to be that distinguishing relationship. So, and all three divine persons, the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, they possess equally the one and undivided divine nature. And all three live in the most complete union and perfect intimacy. So this interior life of God, which may seem to us very abstract, perhaps, and very unsatisfying, um, to me, it's, it's, it's the most beautiful thought. I, I've this has been the mystery that I have, have found most comfort and consolation in contemplating and meditating upon um, since I was a teenager because I can get past uh, perhaps a little bit of that abstractness. I can uh, at least appreciate that this is far greater than I can ever imagine in this world, but this is beautiful. This is the heart of reality. This is God himself that the interior life of God is one of inexpressible joy. God is pure and infinite happiness. If, and if God has revealed to his human friends the intimate secrets of his inner life, secrets that only he could know, it was in order to incite us to love and adoration. And perhaps 
what is even a bigger surprise is that God desires to share with us his own inner life. And that's the whole purpose of our existence. That's what heaven is all about. Or shall I will explain, maybe on a future show more, uh, more deeply when we get into to, uh, what um, the beatific vision is. It's really to plunge into this interior life of the Holy Trinity. It's not just to look at a, a bright light and say, wow, that's pretty nice. It is to plunge in the infinite ocean of, of, of the knowledge and love of God. Well, <laughs> Father, I, I, I have to say um, I think that's the best explanation I've ever heard for the, the Holy Trinity, and I, I don't think I really understood it until uh, we did this show. So, I hope um, you don't understand it completely. Well, <laughs> well not, not completely, <laughs> no. but I, I think I can I at least uh, can, um, appreciate begin it. to grasp it or appreciate it a lot more. Right, right. Um, so, uh, well, did, did, did you have some reflections on each of the divine persons that you wanted yes, to... Uh, yes, I just wanted to go a little bit more into uh, certain reflections on each divine person. I didn't want didn't to clutter that uh, section on uh, what I wanted to deal with their relationship because you would lose the big picture. I wanted to present the big picture before I make some reflections. So, because each person has his own special characteristic because of his very relation to each other in the, in, the, in the Holy Trinity. And there's a reason why they have the names that they have. And, and we creatures, uh, we have a re special relationship almost, uh, you might say, um, to each person. Yeah, although they are equally the one true God whom we adore and are meant to love with all our hearts and minds, um, there is something special of each person that, that uh, can draw from us at least nourishment for our spiritual life. And I wanted to begin by first laying the foundation that Catholic theology teaches us that all the activities of God ought extra, which means meaning uh, outside of his own inner life, namely all the activities in creation, that these, all these activities in creation are common to the three persons. For example, creation. Creation was the work of the entire Holy Trinity because creation is the work of God and there's only one God. There's only one divine will. And when God willed to create, it was the Holy Trinity acting as one God, creating. And yet, at the same time, don't we say that the Father is the creator? And that's true, we say that. But that's, not because, that's not excluding the other persons as being the creator as well. And, and this brings us to something in theology. We have something that is called appropriation, which is ascribing certain activities in the world um, to a specific divine person because of their very uh, relationship in the life of the Holy Trinity. That in some sense, this title, Creator, belongs in a special way to the Father. Although the Son and the Holy Ghost are creators too, but it's something special about His personhood, that He deserves that title. And this is what we call in theology appropriation. And we call the Father the Creator because that title seems to fit him more especially because he is the source, if we can use that word, he is the source of the other divine persons. He is their origin. They received their divinity from him, from all eternity, but they received it from him. He is not greater than them, but he is the origin of the other divine persons. And so we... And so we naturally refer to him as the creator in a very special way because we owe our origin to him as well. So each divine person is given certain titles. And the Son and the Holy Ghost, they've received uh, special missions in the world. Um, although everything that is done in creation is the work of the entire Holy Trinity as one God. And I'll give two more quick uh, examples. Is that um, we take the incarnation, for example, is that it is our faith that only the Son uh, assumed the human nature, that only the Son, when we say, who is Christ? He is one who. He is the divine person. He has two what's. He has two natures, but he's only one who. He is, he is the second person of the Holy Trinity. But yet the whole incarnation, the, the, the creation of the humanity, of the sacred humanity of Christ, all his miracles, they are the work, the Holy Trinity, because that is outside the interior life of, uh, of God. So that's odd extra. So that is why we have uh, at the incarnation, the angel Gabriel saying to Our Lady that 
the, the Holy Ghost shall come upon you, and the power of the Most High shall overshadow you, so that the very conception of Christ in the womb of our, our Lady, our Blessed Mother, was the work of the Holy Ghost. And yet it was the work of the Father as well. And everyone, but it's, it, it is applied to the Holy Ghost because the Incarnation is an act of love, and the Holy Ghost is love itself. And this is also true of, and yet uh, Christ, uh, the second person, is our Redeemer. Only the second person died on the cross, not the Father. The Father did not suffer. It wasn't his human nature that suffered. It was the second person that suffered. And yet the Father was present in the Son. The, fa the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, they are present in each other. This is called circumcisio. They are, they, they are present in each other. The Father is in me and I in the Father. Um, another example I wanted to give is that uh, it is said that when someone is in a state of grace that the Holy Ghost dwells in their soul. And this is true. But it is also true that the entire Holy Trinity dwells in the souls of the just. But this, this function is appropriated to the Holy Ghost because it is his mission in this world to sanctify us. And there are many other things that could be said with, about these appropriations which will come up over other episodes. And that's other aspects of theology that may not even be, uh, show up in, in uh, a show on the spiritual life. But I wanted, to, again, to take each divine person and to just make some brief uh, uh, reflections on them. And we come to God the Father. We come to the first person of the Holy Trinity. And, and preparing for the show, I've been trying hard to think of ways that I can describe them. In a sense, to me at least, to me at least, the Eternal Father is the most mysterious in one way. That um, when I was describing the interior life cycle of the Holy Trinity, you know, much was said about how the Son was begotten, much was said about what the Word and the Son and how the Holy Ghost proceeds, really, but not much was said about the Father. You know, I had uh, a little to say of being the Eternal One, you know, conceiving in His mind. But when we reflect on His very name, we, we have to adore him in a very special sense, uh, not more than the others, but in a special way. He is called the Eternal Father. The word eternal belongs especially to him. You can say the Eternal Son, but theology normally doesn't say that. We say the Eternal Father because he possesses the divinity of himself, and he received it from no one. He has been called the wellspring of the deity or the fountainhead of the deity. He is simply God. And that is why Scripture refers to him simply as God. You know, our Lord says, This is everlasting life, that they should know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. This other important quote that you see everywhere. But notice the word, God so loved the world that he sent his only Son into the world. Who loved us? The Father loved us, and he sent his Son. Our Lord, who normally refers to God by the term Father, also uses the word God, simply to refer to his Father. He says, I came out from God, he said. I ascend unto my God. And on the cross he cried, God, my God. You know, many other quotes could be given from Scripture where, where just the term God refers to the Father. Um, although the Son is equally God and the Holy Ghost is God, but that term God refer, that is specially reserved for the first person. And even when you look at, even when we call the second person of the Holy Trinity the Son of God, we are giving the title God more especially to the Father. We don't traditionally say of the first person that he is the Father of God, but that would be accurate because he did beget a divine person. He is the Father of God. He is the Father of God the Son. But again, we reserve the word God especially to him. That is significant, I said. And what does this all lead to? It leads to this, I think, that we ultimately owe everything we are and everything we do to the Father, everything we, we have to the Father. Just as the Son of God and the Holy Ghost can say that the, everything they are, they receive from him. He is the ultimate source of all the good and truth and beauty in our lives. Every blessing we have received or will receive. He is the reason why we exist, the reason why we have any hope of salvation. It was the Father who gave us Jesus Christ. And they sent the Holy Ghost to sanctify us. And so all hope of heaven is because the Father has loved us. He loved us in his Son and through the Holy Ghost. And besides I said, remember that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten God, the Son. God the Father so loved the world. He so loved us. And that should speak volumes to us. So what do we owe the Father? We owe everything, everything we have. He is truly a Father to us. 
That's his whole personality, is to give himself, to give of himself. He gave his whole being to his son, and he gives us the good things of creation. He is truly a tender father who loves us more than we can ever possibly fathom, and we should love him in return with all our hearts. So let us reflect. Also, what strikes me when you read the Gospels, what is the spirituality of our blessed Savior? We never ask that. What was his devotion? What was his primary devotion? His father was. He loved his father. His father was everything to him. He received everything from his father. His food was to do the will of his father. He speaks of his father. He only says what his father tells him to speak. He only does what his father wants him to do. He does all the things that please the father. That's amazing when you think of it. That his spiritual life, his devotion was everything for the Father. The Father is everything. I am a true son, and I just want to serve and please my Father. That's amazing. That is, that is what we should imitate as well. So let me move on to God the Son. And this brings me to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the Word incarnate, God in the flesh. The Father did not become man, nor the Holy Ghost, but only God the Son. Our Lord said, All that the Father has are mine. So he received his divinity from the Father, but he did receive everything. He inherited all that the Father possesses, his own infinite and eternal nature. He is equal to his Father in all things. He is the wisdom of the Father. He is truth itself in the flesh. I am the truth, he said. So everything in creation, you think of this, everything in creation is a faint reflection of a perfection found in God. Now it it is found in God in a super eminent way, in an infinite way, in a perfect way. But creation is a finite and imperfect image of God. Now, the Word is the infinite and perfect image of God. And therefore, creation is ultimately a faint reflection of what the Word is. He is the plan of which God created the universe. All the angels, all mankind, every perfection found in creatures has some truth in it, in the sense that it has real being. And it is thus modeled off truth itself. Jesus is the truth. The Word is the truth. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by him, and without him was made nothing that was made. So the Son of God knows everything there is to know about creation. He is the architect who has finally the chance to walk through his own building with two legs. He knows everything about creation, yet he's never walked in it. He knows everything about uh, sweeping the house, but yet he's never done it before. He knows everything about food, but yet he hasn't had a stomach or a mouth yet to eat. And now he's acquired a human body to experience that in a finite human way. But he knows all of creation perfectly because it is his. It's his creation. And this includes us. He knows each of us perfectly. He knows us. And when God knows us, when God knows us, or he knows anything at all, he knows us in his Son. The Son of God is the knowledge of God in person. God knows himself and us in the Son. And wisdom, who ordered all things at creation, has come himself into this world that he himself designed in order to set things right. And so that's why the redemption has been termed a recreation in grace. Our Lord said, Behold, I make all things new as he originally made all things. The Son of God came into this world to redeem us, to open the gates of heaven, to lead us back to the Father, back to God, by making us sons of God. He purchased us, uh, purchasing for us by his precious blood, sanctifying grace, in order to transform us to true adopted children of God. And he is the perfect Son of God. He is the model off of which we must conform ourselves in order to be pleasing to the Father. So our religion is actually quite simple. It is God is our Father, and we have to become good little children. That's how simple it is. What else can be said except let us remember that it was the Son alone who became man and suffered untold suffering and agony for us because he loved us. What more can, what more can our Lord do for us that he's not done? And we owe him everything we are. And that is why our Lord is the perfect revelation of God, of God as Father. He reveals what God is like. Jesus is God acting humanly. Show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Uh, and he said to Philip, He who sees me sees the Father. 
That is a beautiful thought. This is God. This is how much God loves us. So let me go on to the Holy Ghost. Let me just say a few words in regards to the Holy Ghost. First of all, let us look at his very name. I already explained why he is called Spirit, because Spirit means breath. He is breathed forth, as it were, by the Father and Son through love. But why is he especially called holy? Why? The Father is holy. The Son is holy. But we reserve that term holy most especially to the third person. Again, it is because the manner of his procession from the Father and the Son. What is holiness? Why is God holy? Why is he holiness? And Father Lean tells us that holiness is nothing else than a willed yielding to the appeal of the divine goodness. Holiness is is simply to love that which is worthy of our supreme and absolute love. And God alone is worthy of our supreme love. So when we ask the question, what is it that makes God holy? We answer this, that, that God's infinite holiness consists in his charity, his infinite charity. That is, his infinite love of himself. And to some, that may sound like infinite pride or an immense egoism, but... Pride is the inordinate love of self. Notice the word inordinate. It means out of order. It is to love something in the wrong way or or love something that you shouldn't love or or love something in excessive amount. But God's love of himself is not out of order but in perfect order. He loves what should be loved. And God is holy because he loves what is infinitely worthy of being loved. that's That's what... essentially what makes up his holiness. So God is love. Scripture itself says God is charity. And charity is the love of the supreme good, which is God. Um, God is essentially love. And that's why holiness um, belongs to the third person. That term holy belongs to the third person because he is essentially the love of God. And this gives us a clue into our own sanctity because The essence of what makes us holy is charity. Not our asceticism, not our knowledge, not how the miracles that we may, God may uh, allow us to do. Um, None of those things. It is how much love of God is in your soul. That determines how holy you are. Sanctity begins with and progresses and ends with the love of God. Love is everything in the spiritual life. And that is why Christ said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with thy whole heart and with thy whole soul and with thy strength and with all thy mind. Because that is what the Holy Ghost is. He is the love of God. Um, And this is important because sometimes we think, I can't, I don't know all this stuff or I can't perform miracles like the saints did. I can't perform all their mortifications. But again, the essence of holiness is not in mortifications or any of these other things. It is the love of God, and everyone has the power to do this. If God commanded us to love him with all our hearts, it's because we can do that. We are able to do that. So to close this subject on the Holy Ghost, I have to, I'm have i going to quote Father Lean. I haven't really referred to him too much, even though all what I've been saying is what Father Lean taught. I, I, I paraphrased him. Uh, I expounded on it. Uh, I was inspired by his chapter more than anything. But I want to quote now from the end of his chapter. He says, In this lies the wondrous attractiveness of the divine, the third person of the Blessed Trinity. He is all love. His personal characteristic is to be love. He is love and nothing but love. Everyone understands what is meant when a person is described as being all heart. One who is so described is a person endowed with a loving and generous nature and impelled by that nature to pour forth all its resources in the service and in the interest of others. By a metaphorical use of language, the Holy Ghost may be described as being all heart. He is, as it were, the divine, the living, the uncreated heart of the great God. It is our solace and our ground of confidence to contemplate the Savior Jesus in that representation which sets visibly before us in his sacred heart, the outstanding feature of his human character, his love. In it we find our hope, our consolation, and our comfort. Now what the sacred heart is in the God incarnate, that the Holy Ghost is in the God that dwells in light inaccessible. It is that unseen God, 
contemplated as love personified in the literal sense of this phrase. Sinners and saints, the imperfect as well as the perfect, when they know that they have but too much reason to fear the blows of God's justice, instinctively take refuge in the thought of God's goodness and love. If the turning to this love of God considered abstractly can bring trustfulness to the sinful, comfort to the weak, and joy to the strong, how much more intense would these emotions be if thoughts and affections were directed towards that one person who personifies, who, figuratively speaking, embodies in himself the love of God. As the Holy Ghost is the link, the bond of union between the Father and the Son, so too it is in the Holy Ghost and through the Holy Ghost that the creature is united to the Creator. This truth of Catholic theology, that it is by the Holy Ghost that God the Father and God the Son love us, should, if it were clearly apprehended by Christians, exercise a powerful effect in promoting personal devotion to the third person of the Blessed Trinity. The interior life receives a great impetus when the soul realizes the characteristics of the Holy Ghost and understands that it may treat with Him in the same distinctive way in which it has learned to treat with God the Father and God the Son." Unquote. And just one last thing with the Holy Ghost is, our Lord said He sent the Holy Ghost. His mission was to sanctify the Church um, because the work of sanctification is a work of love. He is called the Spirit of Truth because we are given the truths of our faith ultimately to sanctify us. The truth shall sanctify us. And that is why the Holy Ghost is called the Spirit of Truth. Our Lord called him. He said uh, that I, I, he, he is another advocate. He is another consoler. Our Lord was a consoler when he came in his physical uh, body, when he, when he walked this earth in his, uh, during his life. Uh, and then when he ascended to heaven, he sent another consoler. The Holy Ghost is our friend. He is the divine friend. And we should have absolute confidence in the Holy Ghost. He loves us intensely. He is the love of God for us. And so we should go to him for enlightenment, that he guides us, that he inflames us with his charity. And that what I forgot to do at the beginning of the show, which I should have done, was, was recite that prayer to the Holy Ghost. Um, we'll do that next show. But I just wanted to end um, with, with a, a, a few uh, practical applications uh, of this doctrine. And there's so many things that could be said. And uh, that is, again... All of spirituality is a commentary on the Holy Trinity, ultimately. Ultimately, the Holy Trinity is important because the Holy Trinity is God. This is, this is an objective truth. The Catholic God is the one true God. There is only one God, but there are three divine persons who possess this one divine nature. This is objective reality. This is not wishful thinking, just a, a mere beautiful thought. This is reality. And uh, Frank Sheed in his book, Theology and Sanity, says that sanity means living in the real world. Not necessarily the world that everyone else lives in, but the real one. The Holy Trinity is real. And if this truth is not part of our lives, if we are not living in the light of this truth, then we are not living in the real world. And not to live in the real world, but in an imaginary one of our own making, is to be insane. That's insanity. So theology is really the health of the intellect, living in the truth. And sanctity is the health of the will, living out that truth. The mystery of the Holy Trinity is the foundation of our Catholic religion. The doctrines of our holy faith are not merely entrusted to the church to remain uh, uh, dead words written on a dusty tome in some library, merely to be defended. The faith is meant to make saints and it's meant to save and sanctify souls. That's why Father Lean titled his book, The Holy Ghost, His Work and Souls. Not because our sanctification is not the work of the other divine persons of the Trinity, but because our sanctification is especially appropriate, appropriated to the Holy Ghost. Really, the whole purpose, and I'll close with this, the whole purpose of our religion is to enter into the very life of the Trinity in heaven. Everything we do is for the Holy Trinity, the reason why we're made, the reason why we go to church, but why we go to Mass, why we receive the sacraments, why we pray the Rosary, is ultimately to return to the Holy Trinity. The Holy Trinity is why we have a spiritual life. And the heart of the Holy Trinity is communication, 
relationship, love. And that is why these things are so important to us. We long to communicate ourselves. We long to have a relationship. We long to love and be loved. These things are the most important things to us because we were made in the image and likeness of God. Knowledge precedes love. You cannot love what you do not know. And in this life, we know God by faith, by clear concepts perhaps in this world that we get to revelation. And also as we progress in the spiritual life, eventually we know God by the obscure light of infused contemplation. And finally in the next life, by the beatific vision face to face. But the truth remains, you cannot love what you do not know. God communicates himself first, and then there is a relationship, the word, and then love. And our own spiritual life on earth, as well as in heaven, is meant to be a participation of this interior life of knowing and loving the most blessed trinity with all our minds and all our hearts. And in heaven, our eternal reward will be to plunge, plunge into this ocean of infinite happiness and participate in the very life of the Holy Trinity. We will have and hold God himself in our intellect and our will as our own possession and enjoyment. That is what heaven is. That is what the beatific vision is. We will enter into the joy of our Lord, not our own joy, but enter into his eternal joy, an ocean of happiness. We will know with his knowledge and love with his love, and we will live with his life. And he will be so close to us, and we will be so close to him. It is impossible on earth to express or understand how wonderful heaven will be for those who make it, but it will be inexpressible joy because of the Holy Trinity. Our God is not a lonely, distant God. Our God is a God of life and love and infinite joy. And God said to Abraham, I am your reward, exceeding great. God is our reward. And this will perfectly compensate us for all the trials and hardships that we will have to undergo in this life to make it to heaven. We will find our fulfillment our complete and perfect fulfillment only in God, only in the Holy Trinity. And so, Nicholas, I want to close the sign of the cross in which we invoke the name of the Holy Trinity in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, thank you, Father, for a, another um, excellent and very informative show with lots of uh, lots to think about and lots to lots to chew on so uh, and that's one of the beauties of this being on the internet is listeners can uh, download this and listen to it again um, mm -hmm. in uh, in order to uh, take everything in um, and I before we uh, end the show I would just like to ask our listeners to consider uh, uh, in showing appreciation to Father Bernard for uh, sharing all his insights in the spiritual life with us to support him and his apostolate uh, as we discussed a little bit in the zero show that was aired back in december for the spiritual life uh, father um, uh, is trying to start up a benedictine monastery uh, at his church uh, here in canada uh, as far as i know there aren't now that that christ the king abbey is no more. There aren't any truly traditional uh, Benedictine monasteries that I'm aware of, and uh, that that and just his day-to-day -day work as a pastor at a traditional chapel is all very important work and needs donations to to survive. So, uh, to send a donation, or if you have any questions for Father, anything you wanted to discuss with him, the mailing address is. Our Lady of Victory Church. It's at 1715 Dundas Street East. That's D-U-N-D-A-S Street East, London, Ontario. And the postal code is N5W3E1. Uh, or uh, you can also uh, contact uh, us, uh, contact him through... Uh, the True Restoration Press or tr the uh, True Restoration Radio Network, and um, our, so, uh, Father, uh, could you just give us maybe a a quick uh, a sentence or two on what we hope to discuss next month? Okay. Um, 
wasn't prepared uh, to make a summary, but I would say that it will deal with what the incarnation means and that this will lead into the second mode of God's love, according to, to Father Lean, is that, that um, you know, God is good to all his creatures, but he cannot be friends with sinners. Because friendship implies that there's, a, uh, there's some common bond, some common uh, nature between us. So, um, although God can be kind to us uh, as sinners, uh, in the state of nature, he's kind to us and loving, but he's not really a friend. Um, he doesn't, just like we can be kind to our animals and pets, but yet we cannot truly be a friend to them. We're a friend to another human being. Um, so unless we share a common nature, uh, we're not really friends in the true sense of the term. So that is why God became man, because he became our friend. He became the friend of sinners. But he became, he descended to our condition in order to bring us back to his condition. And this is why St. Augustine says these perhaps shocking words. He says, God became man in order to make man into God. And what we mean by that, that we become partakers of the divine nature. So that he descended, that he was born of the flesh in order that we may be born of the spirit. And that is what sanctifying grace is, that we become partakers of the divine nature and then we become friends with God. So God stooped down to pick us up and raise us up to share his nature, to be part of his family. And so that's what we will deal with, that the incarnation and what that means, how that is part of the spiritual life uh, and our, our uh, relationship with Jesus Christ, uh, the word incarnate, and that, that his main mission was to, to win grace for us and sanctifying grace um, so that we could enter into the very life of the Holy Trinity and and um, sh partake in God's divine nature. This doesn't mean that we become God, but you become, uh, you live with His life. Um, and so I will again probably the next four chapters I could probably uh, join together and describe what sanctifying grace is. Many people do not realize uh, the importance of what that is, and that's really the foundation again of the spiritual life. We we do what we do in order to acquire grace and to grow in grace, and to die in grace. So if you don't understand what grace is, positively, what it is, you're not really going to understand why we do what we do. Why do we go to Mass? Why do we pray a rosary? Why ultimately we do anything? It is to grow in sanctifying grace, become more and more like God, to participate more and more in His very life. Okay. So that is my summary. Right. So, so uh, join us again a month from today. That's the second Sunday in March. And uh, so you've got a bit of an idea of what, we'll be, what you have to look forward to for that. In the meantime, uh, we have shows almost every day of the week uh, on the Restoration Radio Network. Uh, but coming up this week on Thursday, we have Francis Watch, Episode 2, with Bishop Sanborn and Father Chicada talking about the, all the uh, craziness that's come out of Rome in the last month. And a week from today is uh, Trad Reviews 2, traditional Catholic take on uh, some uh, works of uh, print and uh, film. So please be sure to visit audibletrial.com forward slash restoration radio and take advantage of the free 30-day risk-free trial and a free audiobook from the best audiobook website on the Internet. And it's run by Amazon.com. You can find a link to this in our show notes section uh, as well, if you weren't able to get the uh, link down as I read it out earlier in the show. And we at the Restoration Radio Network would ask that if you found this show to be of value to you in your Catholic faith, that you please consider making whatever donation is possible to our apostolate, no matter how small it may be. To, the, to those of you who have donated, a heartfelt thank you for your kindness and generosity. If you have any questions or comments, we'd love to hear from you. Free, free, free to leave us a message on our Twitter handle, Twitter handle at True Restoration, or via email. Uh, you can mail, get us at mail at truerestoration.org. We want to remind you that the Spiritual Life is a production of the Restoration Radio Network. All rights are reserved, and any duplication without explicit written permission is forbidden. Although, as I mentioned earlier, permission can usually very easily be obtained by writing to us at mail at truerestoration.com. 
So until next time, keep the faith. And thank you again, Father. You're welcome. God bless you. Oh,